off yesterday, we were in the middle of an example. So I showed you uh, Thurston's decomposition of the figure eight knot complement into two ideal tetrahedra. And we ended up with something that essentially looks like this. Um, this is not quite what was on the board because I didn't draw for you uh, both pictures. So this is, this was the top. And this one was on the bottom. Uh, also, I have moved my head. Yesterday's picture, I had my head on the inside of the ball on the top. This time, I've moved it to the outside. So there's a little bit of checking that what I have done, written down here is the same as what I wrote down yesterday, but, uh, but it is. Um, we've also, we've, so we've decomposed the figure eight knot complement into two ideal tetrahedra. And remember, last time we were talking about edge parameters of a tetrahedra. So each of these tetrahedra gets its own edge parameters. I've called the one on uh, this tetrahedron, I've labeled with a Z, um, and this one I've labeled with a W. So we actually have three edge parameters per tetrahedron, which I've labeled Z, Z prime, Z double prime. Recall that opposite edges have the same label. Um, and then also we have this relationship between the edge parameters. So Z prime is one over one minus Z, Z double prime is Z minus one over Z, and then similarly for uh, W and W prime. Okay, so at this point we can write down the uh, edge gluing equations for the figure eight knot complement. So recall that when we walk all the way around an edge, we take the product of uh, the edge parameters that are associated with that edge, and we need that, that product to, um, to be equal to one. Okay, so if we look at, we've got two edges. One of them I've marked with one tick today. If we look at all the edges with one tick, we get a, a Z, a Z square, or a Z double prime. Here's another Z. Uh, we get a W, a W prime and then another w, so. Uh, so the equation coming from this edge is just that this is equal to one, and that's the same as uh, z squared times z minus one over z, w squared, w minus one over w, which is uh, z, z minus one, w, w minus one. This should be equal to one. Okay, and then recall also that the imaginary parts of Z and W have to be positive. Um, I'll note that over here. Okay, and so these two things put restrictions on what Z and W are available, and we end up with you can figure out exactly what um, Zs are legal. Uh, it's a region that looks so in the complex plane. It looks something like you can't. This, uh, Something like this. So it's above, the imaginary part of Z is zero, but the imaginary part of W is zero, rules out a particular infinite ray. Anyway, you can, uh, for fun, if you want, you can figure out what this region of possible solutions look like. Those, these are the solutions to the gluing equations. Okay. Any questions on that? All right, so then let's carry on. So we have this two real dimensional space of solutions to gluing equations, but remember last time I told you that by mostel prasad rigidity, there actually is one unique complete hyperbolic structure on this. So it's somewhere in this two dimensional space, but we need to find it. So in order to find it, um, we need to take more into account than just the gluing equations. Uh, and what, what we need to take into account is um, a condition to make sure that our hyperbolic metric is complete. And in order to do that, we need to consider the neighborhood of the knot. So recall so 
So our knot looked like this. If we remove the boundary of a neighborhood of the knot, then we get uh, we get a torus. And the, what, how does this torus relate to the ideal polyhedra? Well, remember the, the neighborhood of the knot, these things got shrunk to ideal vertices. So a torus boundary is obtained by truncating the ideal tetrahedra and seeing where the truncated triangles go. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we are going to look at the truncated tetrahedra and we're gonna start gluing together the triangles on the, of the truncated tetrahedra and see how they glue together. Okay, uh, so let me see. So I don't want to draw this again, so let me scoot it down so that I can. Maybe I'll move that one up, this one down, and grab a different color. Okay, so let's start by looking at this vertex right here. So if I truncate the vertex, I'll get a little triangle that looks like this. I'm going to label that A. Uh, if I, I can think about looking down from, if I'm in the universal cover that's hyperbolic three space and I'm looking down from infinity, I will see the triangle A on the plane looking something like this. Um, it has got edge invariance. So coming out of the board, there's going to be this edge with one tick, which is labeled Z. There's an edge with, um, this edge with two ticks is labeled Z prime. And then there's this edge up here with also one tick labeled Z double prime. Okay, so I want to see how this is glued. This is going to be glued um, along the side here to another um, triangle. So in particular, this side of the triangle lies on the face A. It runs from an edge with one tick to an edge with two ticks. So over here, I glue this face A to this face A. The guy that runs from an edge with one tick to one with two ticks is this, it's this edge right here. So this triangle is going to be glued to a triangle that looks like this, which I'm going to call H, because that's what it's called in my notes. Okay, so then we can put it in and we can put down its edge invariants, um, which are, so the thing with the two ticks has a W prime. The thing with the one tick here had a W. And so that means this one has to be a W prime like so. Okay? Okay, so then I can carry on. So let's look at this face here. So from the W to the W prime is on, uh, is on the face C, and it's where the one tick edge runs to a two tick edge. So over here on the face T, C, where a one tick edge runs to a two tick edge, that's here. So this edge glues right back to A once again, okay? And then similarly, you can check, this is, this is H again down here. So what has happened? I've just found, um, I, well, I've, a bit of the fundamental domain for the torus. So these two triangles wrap once around a meridian. So if you run from H to A to H, back to A again, you've made, you've made a closed circle on the torus, okay? All right, so there's one generator of the homology of this, this torus up there. To find the other one, we continue gluing. So if you carry on, um, the next triangle over here is this one, B, and we can put its invariants on there. Let me. Um, let me complete the picture. One, two, three, four. Okay, so exercise for you is to finish this picture.
So part of that, I've labeled these triangles A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Find where they are on here. Find the edge invariance. We're going to need that in a minute. I'm going to tell you the answer. But it, as you can see, it takes a little bit of time and thought to go through it. It's worth going through if you haven't done it before. But anyway, so we can complete this. And then it turns out that over here is where we start repeating again. So here's A one more time. So a fundamental domain for this torus is given by this region here. Something like that, OK? All right, so here is a fact I should maybe write as a theorem. Um, we get a complete hyperbolic structure uh, if and only if, well, we have the, the gluing equations, I, I guess I should say, and And uh, uh, this torus has a Euclidean structure. OK, so there's going to be an induced structure coming from the geometry, coming from picking these edge invariants. And if that's, that structure needs to be Euclidean in order for this to give you a complete structure. OK, so without going into much detail of why that is, if you have, say, a non-Euclidean structure on your torus, maybe something like this. This is going to be an affine torus. If it's not a parallelogram, it's some sort of a trapezoid or something in this case. If you start gluing this together, so your gluing says this side of the torus glues to this side of this torus, so I've got to scale and rotate a bit. And then I've got to scale and rotate a bit more. Right. If you start trying to fill out your plane with these things, um, you're going to get something that's going to be wrapping, spiraling around. There are going to be self-intersections. It's going to be missing a single point somewhere in the interior. And uh, if you think of this, you think of your triangulation as living off of this, they're going to be intersecting each other in strange ways. They're going to be getting scaled. Anyway, it's not going to be a complete structure. OK, so incomplete. OK, so in order to get a complete structure, we need a Euclidean torus. How do you get a Euclidean torus? Well, you have a Euclidean torus if and only if these translations in the directions of the generators um, are pure translations, no rotation and no scale. So uh, in particular, if I took a, a vector that runs along this edge here, and I translate it over to this other side, um, there should be no rotation and no scale to go between these two edges. OK, so no rotation, scaling uh, between orange edges. OK, but we can read what happens to this orange edge straight off of this diagram using the edge invariance. So in particular, I can go, I can take this edge, and I know that if I rotate this way, I will get an edge that now looks like this. And what is this rotation? This is just a multiplication by z double prime. Right? So if I rotate. In the counterclockwise direction, I get a z double prime. Um, I can then rotate in this direction. I'll get a new edge that looks like this. This is a clockwise rotation. And so I pick up a 1 over w prime in this case, because I've rotated clockwise. So this is similar to what we were doing yesterday. Remember, we, were, we had these. Um, we had this triangle with vertices at 0, 1, z, and then we noticed that if we put a new triangle on here with edge invariant w, we ended up with a zw. That, that is, the edge invariant that was here was rotated, was multiplied by z. So um, uh, if I follow, I do this rotation all the way along. At each step, 
I am going to either get a, an edge invariant or one over an edge invariant. And I take the product of all of these, and that's going to tell me how much rotation and scale I have picked up. So I want the product to be identically one so that there's no rotation or scaling. Okay, so that's the picture. Let me try and write this down in words. Okay, so there is, we have a Euclidean torus. Um, if and only if this orange edge on the left is mapped uh, to, um, to this orange edge on the right, Without rotation and scale, I guess I already said that. But in terms of the edge parameters, if we have an edge parameter labeled zi, then to go from this to this, this is a counterclockwise rotation, we multiply by zi. Um, but if we are going clockwise, so from here to here, we would multiply by 1 over zj. Um, and then more, more generally, you jump ahead to the definition. OK, so let's let M be a manifold with an ideal triangulation and T, a torus boundary component. OK. Uh, and finally, finally, let's let alpha be a simple closed curve on this torus T. So we're going to define a number h of alpha to be the product of zi to the epsilon i, where here zi is the edge parameter at any corner cut off by alpha. OK, I guess I should say to you, alpha is a simple closed curve on T. We're going to put alpha into general position with respect to the triangulation. So meaning it doesn't go through vertices. It only goes through edges. It goes through monotonically. Um, the, the technical definition is normal form with respect to the triangulation. But just don't let it backtrack. Let it just, so it cuts off a single corner at every, in every triangle. OK, so uh, all right, so you, you keep track of the corners that you cut off. They have an edge parameter. You write that down. But then you take them to the power epsilon i. This is a plus or minus 1, depending on whether you went clockwise or counter, counterclockwise. So plus 1 if the corner is to the left of alpha. So in other words, counterclockwise. And epsilon is minus 1 if the corner is to the right. OK, so here's our definition. This gives us a new equation in terms of our edge parameters. 
And we take, let's take your alpha beta generators. So take two generators of the homology group of the torus, then the equations h of alpha equals 1 and h of beta equals 1 are the completeness equations. All right, so now I can put down a theorem. And this is due to Thurston, I believe. So basically what this theorem says is your gluing equations and your completeness equations are enough. They will find for you the unique hyperbolic structure. So precisely if M is a three manifold with torus boundary, with an ideal triangulation, uh, with edge parameters, say Z1 through Zn, we have one for every edge. And if these satisfy the gluing equations and the completeness equations, Then the interior of M, so the interior of M bar, which I'll denote by M, this, is, this admits a complete hyperbolic structure. Uh, given by the geometric triangulations with these edge parameters. So the edge parameters are determining for me a collection of hyperbolic tetrahedra. And the theorem says if they satisfy gluing and completeness equations, then that's all that we need. We can take these hyperbolic tetrahedra, we can glue them together, we'll get the complete hyperbolic structure. So let's go back to our example um, for the figure eight knot complement. So I did not put for you all of the um, edge parameters on the uh, cusp. Uh, structure here on this triangulation. Um, but I can, I, we can at least do uh, one of the generators. So let's bring that back. Maybe I'll try a different color. Some of these I know aren't as visible. So I'll, uh, I just covered up the theorem, sorry. I'll draw the edge, I'll tell you where it goes, and then we can look at the theorem again. So another, um, another generator would be the one that goes takes this blue edge from here to here. And notice that that rotates once, uh, what is that, clockwise? And this way, counterclockwise. So this blue, let's call this, this generator beta. And I did put enough labels up to write down beta, so H of beta. is uh, one over Z prime times W, okay? And this is, should be equal to one. And remembering that Z prime is just one over one minus Z, this tells me W over one minus Z equals one. So there's one completeness equation. Um, the other one, you'll have to check this. But uh, I got, so this is a double prime inverse. No, 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 Z double prime. Right, so we, we know that step. We went, uh, the first one is, uh, w, times the one is w times, 
right. Yeah, have I got that wrong? I've got these upside, I've got it upside down. It ends up being equivalent, but it should be one over that, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, 3w times one minus. So I'm going clockwise for the first guy, right? So that's a one over z prime. And then I'm going counterclockwise, so that's w. Okay, so I got this part right. Yeah. That's equal to one. And then z prime yeah. is one over one minus z, so it should be one minus z times w. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, does that look right? All right, excellent. It's good to have so many people checking. Okay, check this one now. <laughs> I ran out of space. <laughs> Okay, so this one there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight steps, corresponding to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different terms. And most of these will cancel, right? So we get these two cancel and give me a minus one. Um, these two cancel and give me another minus one, so the minus ones are gone. Uh, these cancel and give me a minus one, and these cancel and give me, no, that doesn't cancel. That's because I got this one upside down. Okay, and they give me a minus one. And so anyway, what I end up with is, uh, I think w squared over z squared. Okay, so I think that looks like I did the algebra right to get from here to here, but you have to check that I did the, I did the labeling right to get this bit. Okay, so this gives me two completeness equations. One, two. I have one gluing equation. I actually have another gluing equation, um, but if you check, that other gluing equation is redundant. So some people are nodding, they've already checked. Yes? May I ask why you need two, uh, two of these equations? If you have two vectors that are parallel in the plane, then the other two are parallel as well, right? Um, if you have two, okay, so you were asking why do you need two equations? If you have two vectors that are parallel in the plane, the other two are parallel as well. That's right, but um, one of these is, is telling us how our vector is changing in this direction. The other one is telling how our vector is changing when we move it in a different translation. So it could be that we get a nice straight, uh, well, a trapezoid, for example. Well, mm. so it could be that I have a vector here which when I go this direction stays, there's no rotation and ro no scale, but when I take it this direction, there is rotation and scale. So I do need both equations, just, it's not because, uh, it, it's not the vectors that are important, it's what the, um, what the uh, edge invariants are doing to the vectors that, we're, that we need to keep track of. Okay, does that make some sense? So I'm keeping track of this, the shape of the torus, really. I need two, both alpha and beta to keep track of the shape of the torus. Okay. All right, so if you believe that, or if we can accept that, then we can figure out what the complete hyperbolic structure is on the figure eight knot complement. W z, z minus one, w, w minus one equals one. W squared over z squared equals one. 1 minus z times w equals 1. Okay, so this equation tells me that uh, z is equal to plus or minus w, but because the imaginary parts of both have to be positive, z is equal to w. All right, so that's what I get from that one. Here, this means then that z squared z minus 1 squared equals 1, and here, 1 minus z times z is equal to 1, uh, which tells me that this guy is actually, if you take the square root of that, we get the negative 
square root. Um, so I want to have my notes handy because it's algebra from here. <laughs> so algebra tells me z times z minus 1 is negative 1, um, which tells me that And then quadratic equation uh, I get the um, primitive cube root of unity is what my edge invariant is. So what is that? That means my tetrahedron, oh and this is equal to W. So W and Z are both given by what, are, what is called the regular ideal tetrahedron, this is the, an equilateral triangle. So I should, sorry, we only need the, the, the top one, not the negative. Okay, so that is gluing these two tetrahedra will give you a complete hyperbolic structure on the figure eight knot complement. Questions? Yes. Uh, why is the orange curve a meridian? It's only special to this particular case. The reason that in this particular special case the orange curve is a meridian is because the tail of that curve is glued to the head of that curve. And the reason they are glued is because we traced through the gluing and we found that this A is mapped to a triangle right up above it in such a way, right? This triangle A is glued to H, is glued back to A. So this edge is taken to this edge. And so this, um, this point goes to this point. Uh, I guess I haven't really explained that this is an actual meridian. It's a closed curve. Um, it is a meridian. That's an exercise. <laughs> it's a closed curve. Yeah, good question. Other questions? All right, so this is, this is it. This is, this is all you need to do um, to find a complete hyperbolic structure. This is the sort of thing that SnapP does. So you get this collection of gluing, given a triangulation, which SnapP has different algorithms to find. Uh, it will find, get a, a collection of gluing and completeness equations, and then it will solve these nonlinear equations using mathematics. And it will come up with um, solutions. And depending on how careful you need to be, you can feed things to make this um, completely guaranteed to be accurate. Uh, or you can get a rough estimate just using like a Newton's method to solve nonlinear equations very, very quickly. And you can find hyperbolic structures on most of the examples that you can draw for SnapP. Uh, so they have a database of hyperbolic knots, um, hyperbolic triangulations, and manifolds, and then you can, it's got thousands of examples, you can run your conjectures past these. Uh, limitations, though, are that even though we've got thousands and hundreds of thousands of examples, this really only works for small examples, so small numbers of gluings, small meaning up to a billion tetrahedra, fine, but a billion is still a very small, finite number. Uh, it would be nice to be able to find information on families. So infinite families of hyperbolic manifolds and gluing and completeness equations are typically not the right way to go, with a couple of exceptions. Um, so I probably should write that down because that motivates what I want to do next. But just, um, I don't want to erase that. I don't need it anymore, I think, but it just takes so long to draw. I'm going to keep it for another a little bit longer. OK, so comments. This works really, really well for computation. And not so well to find families of hyperbolic manifolds. So infinite families 
of hyperbolic manifolds. Because your Gluing and completeness equations are going to be a new set of nonlinear equations every time. OK, and then finally, one quick note in passing. Uh, I want to say super duper briefly, and I'm not, I'm not going to come back to this. There was a question about how you deal with closed manifolds if you're only using ideal tetrahedra. And the answer is this incomplete picture over here. So uh, there are uncountably many incomplete structures on a hyperbolic manifold, meaning it will satisfy the gluing equations in our situation but not the completeness equation. Each of those is a legal hyperbolic manifold. It's just incomplete. Um, if you take the completion of these in a discrete set of points, you are actually going to get a Dane filling on a hyperbolic three manifold. Um, so this is called hyperbolic Dane filling. So the completion of a collection of very special incomplete uh, structures gives a gives a closed hyperbolic manifold um, uh, this is by by Dane filling okay and so Thurston used this to observe that almost all Dane fillings of a cusp manifold give you something hyperbolic. So this is Thurston's hyperbolic Dane filling theorem. Thurston's hyperbolic Dane filling theorem. OK, and there are various proofs of that available uh, and more pictures elsewhere. So I'll leave it at that. But that's, a, that's kind of a cool result that we're not talking about. So I'll try and point out more cool things that we're not talking about along the way. Um, OK, I think that's all I wanted to say. So move on to a new topic. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, in terms of the affine torus that you get, can you um, stipulate the, the, uh, the slope for the Dane filling? Yes, you can. Yeah, you find it. You can. And it's by like, you say, like, I want this, this rotation to be, you know, I draw the, the shape of the torus, but I want it something. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the way that it works is you, um, this affine torus is going to be missing a point. If it stays, if there's no scaling as you move around that point, then um, there's going to be a pure translation, and the completion is just going to be attaching a geodesic. And a neighborhood of that geodesic is a solid torus, and that will give you your Dane filling. And so to figure out exactly to how to get the right slope, you put in, instead of the completeness equations, you do some Dane filling equations. You need your alpha and your beta to satisfy. You still get these same equations for h of alpha, h of beta, but they now satisfy some different um, value. You need them to give you the Dane filling slopes. And then you can solve for that and find the hyperbolic structure. Yeah. OK, so let's erase. OK, so somehow we have our gluing and completeness equations give us everything we possibly need. Somehow that's too much to deal with families. And you can actually get more information by giving yourself less to deal with. So I'll, I'll make that a little bit more precise as we go on. Um, OK, so here is a new tool that we can use to prove things are hyperbolic. Ah, sorry. OK, and this is kind of a big tool. This is a, a giant hammer. It's not quite a nuclear warhead, but it's close.
Okay, so Thurston proved, Thurston was the one who can, made the geometrization conjecture, which is he conjectured that every three manifold decomposes into pieces that admit one of these eight geometries. The full result was proved by Perlman in 2003. Thurston proved this, though, for a type of manifold called Hawken manifolds, which includes the manifolds we're looking at, like not complements. So um, he was able to prove that for Hawken manifolds, um, in, in particular, let me state this for manifolds with a torus boundary. So let M be the interior of a compact manifold M bar such that the boundary of M bar is a non-empty union of tori. Okay, so then exactly one of the following holds. So M bar contains a special surface. And I'll tell you what these means, these words mean in a second. So there's either a torus, an annulus, a sphere, or a disk. Or M is hyperbolic. So in other words, it admits a complete hyperbolic metric. That's all that can happen. OK, so this theorem, whose proof takes a book to write down, we're not going to do the proof. Um, this, this allows us, though, to, find, uh, it, to, to take the problem of finding hy hyperbolic structures and to turn it into a problem of looking for simple surfaces embedded in the, um, in the manifold, in the three manifold. OK, so let's go over really quickly the definition of some of these terms. Um, essential surface. Okay, so S is a surface which is properly embedded in M. Um, properly embedded? Do we know what that means? It just means so proper, proper B. Embedded, uh, it means that the boundary of S, if it has one, is embedded in the boundary of M. Transverse? Transversal, yeah. Okay, so this surface is said to be essential. if um, two conditions. First of all, there are no compression, compressing disks. So what is a compressing disk? If S, S is your surface embedded in M. So suppose there's this, a disk D. So D properly embedded not properly embedded. It's embedded in M with boundary on S. OK, um, and uh, the boundary of D is an essential curve in S. OK, so that's a, comp a compressing disk um, has this, this essential curve, this essential disk that the idea is you can, you can um, surger along this. You can cut along the disk and replace the surface with one that just goes along D this way and along D this way, and you get a simpler surface. OK, so an essential surface is, can't be simplified. There are no compressing disks. OK, and then the other thing is that it, ha it cannot be boundary parallel. Uh, 
OK, so what, what does it mean to be bounded or parallel? That just means isotopic into the boundary. So the regular neighborhood of a knot, boundary of a regular neighborhood of a knot in S3 is parallel to the boundary of the knot complement. So that would be an example of an inessential torus. OK, uh, and then I should add, uh, there are actually two special cases. Um, an essential, this, this is for the case that S has genus, uh, well, I should say the Euler, negative Euler characteristic. Uh, if we have, um, so an essential two-sphere needs a different definition because there are no compressing disks. This is just, this is a, a doesn't mount a ball. OK, so, uh, so you may have seen this. M is said to be irreducible um, if and only if there are no essential two spheres. And then an essential disk, this is prime. OK, I get these mixed up. Right, so what S2 times S1 is the problem manifold that we're not going to be worrying about. It's, one, it's either prime or irreducible, but not both, but I can't remember which. So, S2, S2 cross S1 is prime, but not irreducible. Okay. So. Yes, connect sums give you essential two spheres, yeah. OK. Um, an essential disk uh, is a disk that is not boundary parallel. So it's, got, it's properly embedded, meaning the boundary of the disk is on the boundary of your manifold, but it's not it, together with the, the thing. It doesn't bound a ball, OK? So if you have, um, okay, I think this is right. If boundary irreducible, irreducible, if and only if, uh, no essential disk. Okay. All right, so, so Thurston's theorem then tells us that if we can rule out Um, manifolds that are not prime, manifolds that are not boundary irreducible, and those with an essential torus or annulus that are not boundary parallel, then we'll know that the manifold is hyperbolic. OK? OK, so at this point, there are lots of different ways that we could go with our remaining 70 minutes. Um, because we've been working with triangulations, I want to continue working with triangulations and talk about how you would see this, or how you would use this theorem in the context of a manifold that admits a triangulation. So that will take us into some normal surface theory which is classical three-manifold topology due to Hawken and Knazer. Um, only they were looking at triangulations with finite tetrahedra, and we've got ideal tetrahedra, so we're going to modify slightly accordingly. OK, so brief intro. So this is following Knazer, 1929, um, Hawken and Schubert, 1961. So this is nice classical stuff. OK. So throughout, P is going to be an ideal polyhedron.
And then we are going to truncate the ideal vertices. And we will call these truncated ideal vertices, in the, in the case of a tetrahedron, we're going to get, let me just draw a tetrahedron for reference. If we truncate the ideal vertices, we'll get these faces that look like triangles. So there will be a triangle here. There's going to be one over here. And then here and here. And I'll take out the extra stuff. OK, so truncated polyhedron looks like this. Um, and these new faces that I've created, I'm going to call boundary faces. OK, then let D be a disk properly embedded in this truncated P. Truncated P. We say that D is normal if it satisfies the following. So D is normal if, and now I have a list, so maybe I'll write the list over here. So first thing, the boundary of D is transverse to everything. So it meets faces, edges, boundary faces, uh, transversely. OK. Um, the boundary of the disk doesn't lie in a single face. So intuitively, when I'm talking about normal surfaces, I'm talking about surfaces that have, in some sense, been tightened with respect to the, poly, the polyhedron. So if you have a disk embedded in your polyhedron whose boundary looks like this, um, intuitively, you can think that this, the disk is hanging off of that some way. You could push it through. And this is exactly the way that a lot of these arguments do. So we don't allow this sort of thing, this, um, a, a disk with boundary and a single face, because this means your surface can be simplified. Okay. Other things that can be simplified. Let's say that um, if, the, if an arc of your boundary of your disk uh, has both endpoints, so in a face, um, cannot have. both endpoints on the same edge. All right, so what would that look like? Either like this, and your brain would say, oh, look, well, I can push that through. Right? You see, obviously, you can simplify that. Um, or on no, not, you can't do the same thing if it's going toward a boundary face. There's actually one more condition here, which is that you cannot have, you cannot be on a boundary face and an adjacent edge, because that also could be pushed past a corner. So I need to add that. Or on an edge, an adjacent boundary edge. OK, all of these things can be simplified. And then there's a fourth condition, which I don't think we really need right now. But I better add it just in case you need it for an exercise. Um, it meets any edge at most once and any boundary face at most once. OK, there are certain applications where you can get away without that. But I'm not sure if they're the ones I'm going to assign to you. So let's put it up there just in case. OK, so then theorem. Oh, 
I'm almost out of time. Okay, suppose M admits a decomposition into ideal polyhedra. If M contains an essential two sphere, it contains a normal one. If M is irreducible, which means it's not the same as prime. Uh, okay, this is bothering me right now. So let's suppose M is not S2 cross S1 either, just so that I have all my terms right. Um, if it's irreducible and contains a, an essential disk, Then it contains one in normal form. And finally, if M is irreducible, boundary irreducible, and contains an essential surface, then it, you can isotope it into normal form. Essential surface S, S can be isotoped into normal form. Okay, the proof of this is a very nice exercise. It's like classical three manifold topology that everybody should do at least once in their life. So if you've done it once in your life, then you're off the hook, but everybody else has to do it. Okay. Uh, okay, so the um, I have one minute. Let me say one minute worth of stuff just to tell you where we're going to go next. So the model for a proof that um, a family is uh, hyperbolic is to find polyhedral decompositions of the family, first of all to um, truncate those, and then to assume it's not hyperbolic. So if it's not hyperbolic, it's got an, an essential torus annulus sphere or disk. Put that into normal form, which you can do by this theorem. If you put it into normal form, then it's got some very nice properties, and, you, and then there's a dot, 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 right? So to show hyperbolic, you say, if not, there exists an essential surface S. It's a sphere, disk, torus, um, annulus. Put it into normal form. Uh, surfaces in normal form have particular properties. So then you do a little work, work a little. And then you get a contradiction. OK, so this is the way. This is the general form of the argument that something is hyperbolic using Thurston's result. And this works for, um, this, this is used for um, alternating knots. So Manasco, 1984, did this. Um, he didn't, he wasn't quite using, he didn't know he was using normal form, but he was. Um, it also works for um, what, what we call uh, manifolds with angled structures, which I'm going to talk about um, next time. This is due to, it, 
It's attributed to Casson. It was never written down until Mark Lackenby wrote it down in 2000. OK, so we're going to go through this proof tomorrow and probably a little bit of this proof. And, um, and then we'll see where we get to from there. So that's where I'm going to stop. So thank you. So where do you see the Ricci flow idea coming in? So where do you see the Ricci flow idea coming in? Thurston did not use Ricci flow no, no, for his proof of the Hawken manifolds. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So the Ricci flow was used by Perlman to show that the closed manifolds were hyperbolic. Thurston and followed Yes, that's right. So Hamilton had this idea. Perlman um, made it all work out. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a totally, totally different technique. Yeah, yeah. It's completely different. So you don't see that in um, any of this. So the geometrization of closed manifolds right. is in that, right. yes. Yeah. You were right, sorry. That's irreducible. That's irreducible? Oh, OK, good. Whew, we better change that. It's one of those things that I'm just, I just don't know well enough, right? So OK, so. Yeah. <laughs> Irreducible, if and only if. There is no essential two-sphere. Um, on the other, we can also rule out S1 cross S2. That's a closed manifold. It's not going to work in our examples anyway. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Oh, sorry. He's supposed to ask that. <laughs> OK, thanks, Jeff. Thank you.